okay good morning hope you all had a good week uh, last week so before last week uh, we were discussing uh, perceptron that right? we started with the mckell and pitch neuron model and uh, we showed how you can construct simple networks which can classify patterns but um, there are limitations that they can only classify linearly separable patterns that is patterns or classes that can be separated by hyperplane so but uh, later on uh, there was a criticism on positrons by minsky and papert that uh, since a two layer network that is a network which has only input and output layer can only classify linearly separable classes there is no point uh, studying multi layer versions of it which is kind of a you know retrogressive kind of argument uh, but that's what they said and because of that there was a lull in research on neural networks for almost a decade right and then the 80s again things picked up and people started studying uh, multi layer perceptrons or, or perceptrons which have more layers than two so if you add a, an additional layer which is generally called a hidden layer between the input layer and output layer suddenly the network uh, has new capabilities and uh, kind of becomes free from the limitations uh, of the of a perceptron so this addition of a new layer or a hidden layer can be done in many ways one of one way is to construct a multi layer perceptron right uh, so here i'm going to take a small detour and uh, describe a different kind of a network called the radial basis function network uh, which is also a neural network and which also has a hidden layer between input and output layer but the hidden layer is actually different from what you have in case of a perceptron so let us see how it is different and so we'll discuss this in this class and the next class we'll get back to our multi layer perceptron so uh, we have seen that in case of a mckellar and fitch neuron or mp neuron right you have a, a neuron having multiple inputs and output y is equal to sigma of uh, wi xi minus b so if you have multiple neurons like this right and uh, so that is when you call it a perceptron so this is called the input layer and this is the output layer and call this yi so yi now is expressed as uh, so now you have a matrix wij right uh, so you have bi so every neuron has a threshold separate threshold bi summation goes over j so this is how you get the yi now for training you have to train the weights wij and also the biases bi so this is a perceptron in case of a multi layer perceptron you have an output layer so sorry here is output layer and then a hidden layer the input layer so the hidden layer responses so all these are mckellar and fitch neurons both the neurons in the hidden layer and in the output layer so this is output layer so this is hidden this is input layer um so this is a mckellar pitch neuron so i'll call this output let's say vj and the inputs now let me call them xk uh, right and out, the actual output is yi so this is a mckellar pitch is also mckellar pitch so you can work out equations we'll see all this in more detail tomorrow or whatever next class so this is a mckellar pitch uh, but no so this is a multi layer perceptron now so you have added a hidden layer and we'll show that just by adding a hidden layer suddenly this network becomes free from some of the limitations that we face in case of perceptron so similarly let us look at a slightly different architecture right it is called radial basis function neural network because in the hidden layer the neurons are <coughs> neuron model is slightly different it's not the mckellar and pitch neuron model 
right uh, here instead of the sigmoid so we, we were using here initially we started with step function but uh, i said that install step function you can also use a smoother version because if it is step function the derivative has a problem the derivative becomes a delta function so which is useless so whereas if you have a smoother version like this then that has derivative everywhere uh, it takes the highest value at the origin but it is non zero everywhere so we'll use this and uh, so that's what you'll use in, in case of mlp similarly in case of an rbf network instead of a sigmoid function we'll use a gaussian all right so this is a kind of a symbolic representation of a gaussian so each of the hidden layer neurons represents calculates a gaussian of the input layer in the output there are no uh, nonlinear neurons it's just a summation so that this straight line indicates it's a linear neuron just a summation of all the outputs of the hidden layer right this can be written in more uh, general terms like this y here if you have only a single neuron let us say that's y is a, so the outputs of each of these hidden neuron let's call this phi of phi okay the input vector is x okay so the output of this you can call it x and a bunch of parameters i'll just call this ci i'll explain all this later right so the vector x semicolon and the parameter ci that is the response of the i hidden neuron and you just sum them up right over a bunch of weights and these weights are wi and you get the output so that is the definition of this kind of particular kind of neural network by contrast you can express uh, mlp also in a very similar way so here i said uh, in the output layer so this is Uh, in the hidden layer, you, you have definitely Merkle and Pitt neuron. In the output layer, you can have either MP neurons or just linear neuron. What does that mean? I don't have this nonlinear function G. I just have a summation. I don't even uh, need to have a bias. So that's okay. But in a multiple perception, it's okay to have not to have Merkle and Pitts neurons in the output layer, but you definitely need to have Merkle and Pitts in the hidden layer. So why we need that? So we'll discuss all that in the next class. <coughs> so, uh, so in MLP now, if you have a linear neuron in the output, so linear neuron, then the MLP. Uh, input output relationship the relationship between the output y and the input x can be also let in uh, express like this and note the similarity between the two uh, two expressions in both cases the there is a hidden layer output which is a nonlinear function of the input x which is parameterized by some parameter ci right and then you take a linear sum of that so that is in in this case in case of rb fns fns the phi is a gaussian function and you have linear sum of that in case of an mlp the nonlinear function is a sigmoid function and you take linear sum of that in both cases it is the approach is very similar so uh, let me uh, well, okay i'll explain this later so thing is this kind of a uh, summation that uh, you are so this setem to express an unknown function here the function is A mapping from x to y is an attempt to express a known function as a linear sum of a family of functions, right? Comes under the general uh, kind of a, a branch of mathematics called approximation theory. Maybe I'll start a new slide. Okay, so this uh, attempt to express an unknown function y as a linear sum of a family of functions, right? Uh, this shows up in approximation theory.
and actually although we it looks like a totally new topic we have done you might have definitely done something like this in your previous math courses right if you look at uh, examples of this uh, is take taylor series right sum of f(x) can be written as uh, f of or f of x plus you know can be written as sum uh, f of 0 plus f prime 0 times x plus and so on and so forth so basically what that means is sum a not plus a1x plus a2x square etc etc so what you are doing here is you are expressing an unknown function as a linear sum of powers of x right so the general so this is like a, you can take it as a family so in this case my pi i of x is x power i okay these are powers of x and i'm expressing an unknown function as a linear sum of uh you know, these powers of x right so since it's approximation it may not be exactly equal to f of x and uh, also so it has infinite is an infinite series so which is also not practical in 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 real in real life so in practice depending upon the level of approximation you want you will take only certain you will truncate this axis as summation at some point and you only take so many terms so another example of this is uh, is uh, two fourier series So what do you do in Fourier series? You have uh, some signal f of t. You can express it as a naught plus some sigma a n cos n omega naught t plus some sigma b n sine b m sine m omega naught t. Okay. So depending upon the level, so this is an approximation. It has infinite terms in it. Right? N is equal to one to infinity. M is equal to one to infinity. So it has infinite terms in it, and depending upon the level of approximation you want, you will only truncate. You will take uh, truncate at some point, and only take so many terms. So here also you are. Uh, this is also a general summation involving a family of functions. In this case, that family pi i of uh, whatever t can be written as some cos of. Uh, I okay some I omega not t plus some theta i because if you have theta i theta i if it is zero you get cos i if it is none pi by two it is sine or you get right so so like that uh, you can express a lot of these results that you have already familiar with from your previous classes as examples of this general form okay these kinds of uh, problems are studied in uh, approximation theory. so both the rbf network and mlp are examples of uh, such summation okay so rbf network uh, is is an example of a supervised neural network that means for a given input it tries to map the input onto a output vector y for which i know the desired output d right and uh, you train the network by minimizing the output error that is some kind of an error between d and y so you can think of it as some kind of a curve fitting problem because uh, both x and x and y are continuous so x is in say rn especially for the rbf network with gaussian right it is using notation h so therefore the network architecture can be given like this uh, so this is x and the hidden layer is h right and there are weights again here and output is uh, f so there are three layers here input layer is where you give the input vector x right then the hidden layer which is which is the gaussians the output layer which is summation of all these gaussians This h is given by the Gaussian, which is given in this form: exponential minus x minus c j whole square uh, by uh, sigma uh, uh, radius, right? Or you can use the uh, notation sigma j here, just to indicate. So, because Gaussian, 
I just one second. Uh, Somebody is at the door. I just come. Hello. Uh, sorry about that. So the Gaussian has uh, a mean value or a centroid, Cj, and uh, this the the width of it. Right, we can call this uh, R J or sigma J. Okay, and you take linear sum of that. In case of MLP, right, we have seen that the uh, we separate the classes using. Uh, uh, this function g of sigma w i x i minus b. So the separator is a straight line, a straight line 2D or a hyperplane in n dimensions. Whereas in case of an RBF network, since the linear function used is g of x uh, you know, um, semicolon c, if you set this equal to some constant, just like you set this equal to this part, if you set it equal to zero, you get this separator. Here also, if we set this equal to some constant, right? That will be like cutting a Gaussian. So Gaussian value is is set to some constant. Let us say some 0.5 or something. I cut this, and Gaussian is we are talking about multi-dimensional Gaussian or multivariate Gaussian. So when you cut it, you get a if it is a symmetric Gaussian, that is sigma is same in all directions. If it is symmetric Gaussian, then it becomes a circle or a sphere or whatever. So in case of today, it becomes a circle. So the separators in this case look like circles, <coughs> and uh, the so this is the center of the Gaussian, and sigma or the width uh, determines how wide it is, how how much is the spread. So just some little cartoon pictures on small width as opposed to large width. So just to give an intuitive idea, let's take a numerical example. So let us say I want to construct. An unknown function, which is just a parabola, so which is shown here, y, y equal to one minus x square. So that uh, curve looks like this. You see this uh, green curve here. Okay, so that is y equal to one minus x square because at x equal to zero, it is one, and x equal to one and minus one, it is zero. So simple, like a belt. Now we've trained uh, uh, like an RBF network with uh, which has four Gaussian. That is in this. Network, there are just four Gaussians in a hidden layer. And if you train that, so what are the parameters that you have here? For each Gaussian, you have centroid and the width. And then there is a weightage which, with which you multiply the Gaussian. And then you add up all those Gaussians to, to get the unknown function, right? So we do exactly the same thing here. Uh, so there are four Gaussians which are discovered by the network after training. So two Gaussians are here one, two. Two other Gaussians, which are kind of here. Uh, so these two Gaussians have relatively smaller width, but they have higher W, right? W1 and W2 are somewhat high. Uh, and the centroid of this is uh, somewhere around minus 0.3, and centroid is uh, somewhere around plus 0.3. The other two Gaussians have somewhat smaller height, whereas Ws are small. Uh, centroids are somewhere around minus 0.5 here, and uh, maybe minus 0.8. And here it is about plus 0.8. Width is very big because uh, you know width is like something like this. This is center, right? Okay, so like that, if you take four Gaussians and just add them up, right, you get a very, this very uh, counter uh, unintuitive kind of a result. The sum of all these is this blue curve, the solid blue curve. So you can see that uh, the solid blue curve very nicely um, fits. The solid green curve, which is a target function. So, just an example of how you can add up Gaussians with different uh, centroid values and width values and heights or the weight values and construct all sorts of target functions. 
So just to get an idea of how this works, uh, in, in one more example, here the target function is assigned curve for one full cycle. And I'm trying to fit it using 10 Gaussians. So I'm showing this fit in three different plots. In the first plot, I'm just showing the Gaussians. So these are just my H of I of X. Okay, so they're all, and this, in this case, the sigma or the width is very small. So they're all almost look like delta function. So in this, here I'm just, the green curves are just H I, H I of X. In this case, uh, I'm plotting W i times H i of X. Okay, so in this case, pure Gaussian, which just shows that uh, sigma is small. In this case, um, the Gaussian multiplied by the weight value. So you can see that, right, the heights are also shown, the blue, the blue curves. So in the third graph, which is a bit faint, hope you can see this, uh, it is sum of all those weighted Gaussians. Right, so since the uh, sigma is so small in this case, even the summation looks like a series of delta function. Okay, it doesn't look it's hardly able to fit the target function. Now let us increase sigma a little bit. The sigma is 0.1 here. So again, same thing. H is the questions are of same height, but the widths are slightly better now. Uh, even so, here the weights are multiplied into the Gaussians, and that uh, such. Weighted Gaussians are now summated. Now, this is slightly better than before, but still pretty bad. Okay, so increase with sigma to 0.2. Individual Gaussians, Gaussians multiplied, individual, individual Gaussians multiplied by the weights, and this is summation. So you see that now it's getting better and better. The fit is getting better and better. Sigma of 0.3, right uh, here you see there's a lot of overlap between neighboring Gaussians. Uh, here the Weight is also a lot more accurate and it's fitting the curve. And summation, most importantly, is a lot more accurate. So for sigma of about 0.45, you see that overlap is pretty high. The summation is fits the, or the sine curve so beautifully, the target curve. So these examples give an intuitive idea of how you can add up Gaussians to construct an unknown function. So this is in 1D, but basically you end up doing the same thing in multi-dimensions. So this actually the using Gaussian is is one only one possibility. The radial basis function networks are a general class of networks where the function phi can be you know can have you know many options. So all of them have a common feature, which is that the function should depend only on the radius, right, and not on the you know so radius as measured from a center. So if you look at a Gaussian, right, and the response only depends on the distance from the center, right? It doesn't, because it's an even function in one dimension. But if you look at a symmetric Gaussian in dimension, the response only depends on uh, the distance from the centroid right? because it depends on X minus some X bar. It only depends on the centroid. Right? So I'll call this radius, right? Uh, X bar can be X bar I, okay? So that Gaussian, the our response depends only on the distance from the centroid right of that Gaussian. So they call this R. So take a more general class of uh, such functions where the response depends on the distance from some center, right? And and uh, so these are called uh, radial basis functions. Okay, they have the property of radial symmetry around some center. So they, they have, and actually there are more conditions on what, what kind of functions are permissible, right, to be used in RBF and then, so I'm not going to get into all the math of that. But uh, the other options are there uh, in addition to Gaussians, right, for example, R square plus C square square root. And note that these are applicable to any, any number of dimensions, right, and uh, ESC is positive and inverse multi, these are called multi quadrics. There are also inverse multi quadrive quadrics where it depends on 1 by r square plus e square square root. And Gaussians are the ones which are most commonly used. The advantage of a Gaussian is uh, as you go far away from the center, the out function output goes down, goes to zero. Same thing in case of uh, the inverse multi quadrics. 
Uh, that's a that's a good that's a great advantage because we will see you know very soon, All right? Whereas the multi quadrants don't have that property. As you go away from the center, the response actually increases and blows up at infinity. Now, how can you use such functions to construct a map? Right? Like, let's take for example the XOR problem. So we have seen that in case of perceptrons, it won't be able to solve the XOR problem because in case of XOR problem, the opposite uh, so it has it is a two class problem. So this is one one, this is zero zero, this is one zero, and this is zero one. So you see that uh, these two form one class, these two form another class. You cannot separate them using the straight line. So this you can solve so beautifully with uh, RBFN. Let us see how it works. <clears throat> so what we do here is. So we'll take an RBF which uh, has uh, two hidden neurons. So input is x1, x2. Both of them feed into two hidden neurons. Here you have Gaussians. And these two sum are summated in the output. So this is y. This is phi1. This is phi2. OK, how, how do this phi1 and phi2 work? So phi one, so the center of the phi one, and I'll call this T one. Center of phi two is T two. Okay, phi one response is it depends on the distance, right? X minus T one norm, and uh, phi two response depends on X minus T two norm. And we are using Gaussian, so this is the expression. Now T one and T two are chosen to be this one one point and zero zero point respectively. Okay, sorry. So if you do that. <laughs> so if T1 and T2 is this, now plug in all the four input vectors, that is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, into uh, these two functions. And you get uh, two-dimensional outputs because and plot this in the axis of phi1 and phi2. So what you will get is, if you input uh, 0, 1, or 1, 0, so because the response of this depends on the distance, from the data point x to the t1 and t2. So if you input uh, either 1, 0, or 0, so this is one of the centroids, another is another centroid. If your inputs are either 0, 1, or 1, 0, uh, if, uh, right, in, in both cases, these two points are of same distance from 1, 1, and 0, 0. So the response happens to be some value like this. So both these points, 0, 1, and 1, 0, Map or oh sorry, map onto the same point in the phi one phi two space. That's what is interesting here. Okay, but if you give zero zero or one one, right? The res the response of in the phi one phi two space they're mapped onto one zero zero is mapped onto this point, and uh, one one is mapped onto this point. So among these four points which you needed to classify. Two of the points got mapped onto the same point here. The other two points are mapped onto this point and this point, respectively. So now your classification problem consists of uh, separating these two points against this one point, right? And that's easy because you can see very easily that uh, these two sets of points can be classified, can be separated by drawing a straight line. So these are your some these are Dayton boundary. So that can be done by a linear stage because uh, in a, a linear stage you can solve linearly separable you know classification problems. Okay, so this is your uh, hidden layer responses, and you can have just weights, and you can easily kind of hand calculate. You don't even need to find the weights by any training. You can easily hand calculate the weights, and it turns out that if you use minus one here and minus one uh, here, right, and a bias value of plus one. Okay, so for y equal to zero. You get class one, and by another way, you get class two. So you can easily solve this problem without any training, just by choosing your uh, network parameters by hand. You see that what could not be solved by network by a network which doesn't have a hidden layer can be solved by a network which has a hidden layer. You can see this in the example with the RBF network. But obviously, if you have more complex problems, you cannot solve uh, the network just by hand calculation. You need to have some kind of training algorithm, right? So let us first see what do we have to learn in case of an RBF network. So there are three sets of parameters. One is centroids or centers of the Gaussians. 
then the widths of the Gaussian, the sigmas, right? And finally, the weights from the hidden layer to the output layer. So these are three things you have to calculate. <coughs> so the here there are uh, many different ways. Uh, some are very intuitive and commonsensical. Some are more rigorous. So the simplest method is to, to set the centers by choosing randomly from the training set. OK, centers are of the same dimension as uh, input data, because you have x minus x bar, right? So x minus, or x minus ti. So x and ti are the same dimension, right? So you can choose the ti by simply drawing from the data set itself uh, randomly. In fact, in this example, that's exactly what we have done. The data set has four points, right? And we have taken two of them and set the centers using those two. In general, that's what you do even in case of larger uh, data sets. The spread, uh, many ways of finding spread. One, the simplest way is to get an idea of the overall span of the entire you know, data set and take some kind of an average. So here, what they're doing is take the maximum distance between any two centers, right, in the in the network, and then divide it by root of m1, which is the number of centroids. Where m1 is the number of centroids, so that gives you some kind of an average distance among centroids. They can use so here they are using the same width for all the Gaussians. You can also use different widths for different Gaussians. They're more uh, kind of involved methods, algorithms for doing that. Now, how do you find the weights? So the thing is, uh, you can choose the centroids by simply taking from data set. You can choose the widths by doing some kind of an average calculation like this. But how do you find the weights? So how do you what is it what is desired about the weights? So the thing is, your output y is equal to sigma of uh, with the sigma wi phi i, right, which is given as the summation. Now, for every this is actual output of the network. So you want that this should be equal to the desired output di. Y of xi is the network's output uh, for a given input vector xi, right? Whereas di is the network's desired output. So the, you want the actual output of the network to be equal to the desired output for each uh, data point. OK, so what we want is an equation to be able to solve an equation like this. Wi, sigma wi phi i should be equal to di. OK, so that's, more, that's what I want. So we can write this as a matrix equation. Your unknowns are the weight values. You take all the responses. Right? So the thing is, you have, let us say, m or m1. Uh, number of then you know, so number of Gaussians. They present each data point to all the Gaussians, so you get M1 uh, responses for M1 numbers. So like that, present all the data points. That's the number of data points is capital N, right? So number of data points is capital N. So you get a response matrix consisting of size capital N by M1. Okay, so this is of size uh, capital N by M1. And uh, whereas this is of size m1 by 1. Sorry, today this program is very jumpy. I don't know why. OK, so, so the weight matrix is just a column vector of dimension m1 by 1. The response matrix is a matrix of size capital N by m1. And this product should be equal to the uh, column vector of all the desired outputs. Which is a column vector of uh, D's or DIs uh, of diamond of size n. So you can write this as a matrix equation. This phi is we define this capital phi as the matrix response of the response matrix. Right? I'll call this the response matrix. Response matrix times unknown vector, weight vector, it should be equal to the uh, desired output column vector. OK, now simpler solution is <coughs> w is equal to this phi inverse times d. Um, now the question is, does phi inverse exist? OK, so, um, so here, if the phi is uh, so state inverse has no meaning because uh, phi in general is a rectangular matrix because n may not be equal to them and n is the typically greater than right m1 because your number of centroids 
for Gaussian will be much lesser than the number of data points. So you use what is called the pseudo inverse, and we discuss this in one of our early classes on uh, where we discuss the math preliminaries. Right. So when the phi matrix is rectangular and the number of uh, rows is much higher than the number of columns, you can do some kind of a least square fit and then calculate what is called a pseudo inverse. So we'll do that. So now there's a very nice theorem, which is, which is the real strength of this whole RBF and uh, RBF neural network, which is that imagine a situation where you take every data point as a centroid. Which, which becomes so very expensive, but uh, let us imagine that. So then in this case, uh, number of data points is capital N, number of centroids or Gaussians is M1. But imagine where you have taken number of Gaussians is equal to also N. And then your response matrix or interpolation matrix, phi, right, is uh, capital N by N by N. Okay, it turns out that with a very mild condition, that is, all the data points should be distinct, right? Data points should be distinct points. That means you should not repeat any data point in, the, in, in your training set, which is okay. Why do you want to repeat the same data point, right? So if you make sure they are all distinct, then this response matrix or the interpolation matrix that you get will be non-singular, which means there is a, you can set away, since it's a square matrix, you can set away and it's uh, the theorem guarantees that it will be non-singular. So you can invert it and solve for the problem. So there's a very nice, it's like a matrix inversion problem, right? Uh, compared to MLP, which has a very complicated learning algorithm. Training, training the RB network is pretty simple because you just choose your centroids from data, data set Excel. And you can calculate the weights by simple heuristic. Once you do that, training the weights itself is a simple uh, question of matrix inversion. That's what is nice about it. and uh, so like I said before, instead of Gaussian, you can use uh, lots of other uh, radial basis functions right in this kind of a network. So there are many different algorithms for choosing this. What we have just discussed is the first method where you choose centers randomly from training set and uh, compute the width by what you have done is a kind of an average. You can also do take some kind of nearest neighbor. Uh, you can use the nearest neighbor method for finding the width. That is, for every centroid, you take the distance to the nearest neighbor and let that be your width. Okay, so other ways is uh, apply k means clustering to the input data set and find the clusters, find the centroids, and use those centroids as centers of the Gaussians. And uh, for the widths, instead of the nearest neighbor, maybe you can use the pth nearest neighbor, not the first nearest neighbor, but the pth nearest neighbor. So we, you can do that, just a small extension. From the previous idea. And for the weights, you can use uh, pseudo inverse or you can use something called the LMS algorithm uh, for finding the weights. Or if you use a more general method, uh, you can use gradient descent to find all the parameters in, you know, in one shot. So how do you do that? So take the, uh, the output uh, error expression like this. So D is the desired output, Y is the actual output of the network. And P is the pattern number. So the pattern numbers goes from one to capital N. So DP minus YP mod square, the, the norm square of this vector square, vector norm. So add up all these uh, square values, the RMS values, and you get the total error. Now the update to each of the weights, how do you gradient descent? So delta W, Right is equal to minus eta times dou e by dou w. So this is a very general equation. Right, uh, w is uh, any of the parameters inside your this y value. In this case, the three types of network parameters. One is the linear weights, the output weights, then the centroids and the and the, and the widths or spreads. So with all these things, there is you can just do differentiation of this output error. And you can derive all these equations. I mean, it's not, uh, and I mean, we don't have to go through all this, but uh, it, the principle is very, very simple. Just differentiate this, get all the, uh, calculate the derivatives, right? And you can get uh, the update rules for uh, all three sets of parameters. 
there are also extensions of this so for example instead of using a symmetric gaussian with the same widths in all directions you can use elliptic basis functions which means the sigma is different in different directions okay so this is sigma 1 and this is sigma 2 right and it they are different in different directions in more general case instead of just one sigma you will have a whole covariance matrix right we have defined that in case of our multivariate gaussian we discuss the <coughs> gmm gaussian mixture model theory we define the multivariate function multivariate gaussian right where the there is a covariance matrix where for the sigma we use the whole uh, for this epsilon parameter we use the whole matrix of the sigma values so that's the most general case and then the gaussian basis function the radial basis so it won't be radially symmetric anymore because it will have different values in different directions we call them elliptic basis functions and they also have been used in the gaussian functions and it has links obviously to gaussian mixture models because here also we are using a linear sum of gaussians to fit an unknown function in case of gaussian mixture models we use a linear sum of gaussians to fit an unknown pdf a probability distribution function okay so also other variations where people uh, dynamically change the size of the hidden layer so there's a there's a model called resource allocation network where initially you start with a small number of gaussians and as the network is trained on an unknown data set you keep on adding gaussians add and as and when it is necessary okay so you dynamically allocate rbfs to the network so there is a, there are some interesting extensions like that so i think uh, we can stop here so that gives an idea of how you can add a hidden layer right to a network which has only two layers and uh, get very interesting functionality um, so one example is rbf network which uh, where you typically use gaussians in the hidden layer but they also you can also use more general class of functions called radially symmetric function and you can even go beyond that and use radially non symmetric functions like the elliptic basis functions for example so this is a very simple network easy to train it's it learns very fast it's much faster than mlp right and uh, it's very intuitive you can easily understand what the net, what the network is doing right so basically you are fitting or you are placing gaussians at different points in the input space at each point uh, so that's that's how you, that's how you find the centers at each point you also determine the width and also find the height and uh, you you calculate or model the unknown function by using uh yeah, by taking the linear sum of those gaussians so um, so we'll see that we'll do something very similar with in case of mlp where instead of gaussian you use a sigmoid but otherwise the overall idea is very similar and all these uh, kind of expressions come under general uh, example of approximation theory and general topic of, of approximation theory the only thing is in case of rbf networks typically we have we take only a single hidden layer uh, but whereas in case of mlp is right uh, we can have we in principle we in general in practice we use uh, any number of hidden layers and that leads us on to the onto deep networks right so in the next class we'll discuss mlps and uh, we'll derive the learning rule for how to train them right and then we'll subsequently we'll discuss how to apply such network for uh, to problems uh in biological data analysis okay uh, any questions